Okay, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the New Era Paranormal Podcast. This week we have JD and Irene back for the podcast interview. The guest for this podcast is Brian Smith, an author of several uh, 10 paranormal books or related to the paranormal. Uh, Brian, can you tell us about how you got started as an author in this genre? You should be good to speak okay. now. Um, I, I was a kid in the 80s. I remember being, you know, three and four years old when Freddie and Jason were, you know, just coming out of popularity. And, you know, they were the rave and slasher movies were the rave. And, um, of course, my mom didn't mind if we watched Freddy Krueger and Jason, but she didn't let us watch the Romero dead movies. And um, I kind of grew up with that. I was fascinated by it. I used to watch TV show anthologies like uh, Tell Some Dark Side and Tell Some Crypt. And um, I used to tell my sister bedtime stories. But when I told the grim fairy tales, I told the nice version, the clean version. I wasn't allowed to tell her the, the real version. So my parents said, hey, you know, you may want to consider something on that. I said, I never really thought about that. And my sixth grade teacher found out that I did short stories. And he says, you write me one of those a week, I'll give you extra credit. And I gave him the first one. And he came back to me that Monday and said, my wife says I'm not allowed to take these home anymore because... She was up all night. <laughs> so was your, were your stories in school, were they more horror based in terms of, you know, like zombies or were they, you know, serial killer or monsters or paranormal? Like Anything the really. other form of paranormal? Anything really. I mean, whatever came to me. I wrote it down like the very first story that I gave that sixth grade teacher was about a guy who found a box and he kept opening it and this creature was stalking him. And I mean, it went on for about four, four or five pages. And I guess everything the creature did to him was bad enough. And I kind of veered off from like, I started with the weird and strange and then I had a period where there were like vampires, there was a um, ghost, and then I just kind of like whatever piqued my interest, it kind of, it, it came to me. And I just like, you know, I got to write this down. And um, my novella Dark Avenues was born from one of those times where I did headstone runs when I was a child. And... I wanted to write something about that because there's something about cemeteries and headstones that coincide with grief, that coincide with death. And I wrote that with the intention of kind of hitting a nerve, not well, well not so much hitting a nerve, but just kind of reminding people that, you know, grief, it's normal, just push through it and get through your life the way they would want you to. And you know, yeah. Do you find do you find that your um, some of, some of uh, your writing? I I, I had the um, privilege of reading your short story in horror zine, um, and I noticed that it was about relationship too, connection to family. Con you know, the brother and the sister. Do you um, do you want to tell us a little bit about that story, and do you connect family in that like in that way, or try to have something some kind of moral lesson? Or is it straight, I mean, a lot of stories do that, but is it is it straight, you know, just for the, the fun and the fear of it? Or is, is there a little bit of that that de, um, relationship development? Well, my sister and I, we've always been close. We've always been like, you know, thick as Steve. She's three years younger than me. As kids, everywhere I went, she went. She had to go with me. And I kind of wanted to convey that into a good short story that would 
kind of make it to where the brother has to protect the sister and the sister protects the brother. So you have kind of, they've got each other's backs. Like, you know, my, my sister and I do, we still do have each other's backs, but I wanted to convey that in a story. And I wanted to add that as a little flavor to the story. Cause I knew that there are other people, you know, men and women out like, you know, myself who have that strong connection to a family member, a brother, a sister, and they know what it would be like if something happened to them, they would be torn apart, they would be shattered. And by adding that to the story, I thought that would heighten the tension that would keep the reader glued to the pages and keep them glued to the story. I try to center on certain messages that people still uh, deal with when it comes to my writing, like um, Abby's Wrath. That is about bullying. We, you know, people deal with bullying every day. And that's something that I've had to go through myself in school. And that book allowed me to get that off my chest and to kind of like just come to peace with it happened, I survived. And yet you have some people out there who didn't, you know, that, that the mental strain on the bullying got to them. And I want to kind of send a message out like, you know, bullying's not okay. And it's a big issue that we deal with every day, you know? Yeah. Well, in, in Abby's Wrath too, it's about, um, just so the, that our audience knows, it's about, uh, three popular girls and they play a prank on so three popular girls play a prank on a girl named abby and abby is driven to suicide which is another intense you know very serious subject and that is a, a serious result of bullying and um and then 20 years later she comes back to play her prank it, so can you tell us a little bit about how, or are you not allowed to like share the information about how she comes back um, to, to deliver that prank? And the suicide aspect of it, was it difficult for you to write about the suicide? Did you feel like you, you know, it's a very difficult, sensitive subject and you can, you can push a reader in the opposite directions. You know, you can push them away from you or draw them in depending on how you present it. Yeah, um, the, the suicide part, that was a little, I wrestled with that because I, I had actually written a scene where it went back to the past and you saw Abby, you know, cut her wrist. And I kind of thought, well, they already know what happened. So maybe I don't need to show it. They know what happened. They know she killed herself and these three girls are responsible for it. And the, the method behind that is it was a, Abby believed that she did nothing wrong and she didn't. Those girls were just bullying her because they didn't like her. They felt some kind of competition with her. And Abby felt like, well, I didn't do nothing to you guys. I don't know why you did this to me, you know? I liked you. I wanted you to be my friends. I wanted us to get along in here. You did, you did this. And what it was is before she died, Abby made a deal with the devil said, Hey, you let me go. I'll give you three to take my place. And I was kind of like, well, that's yeah. So that's something that I, I went with the angle with, I wanted, I wanted them to get their comeuppance and I wrestled with two different endings, the ending that's in the book now and the ending I was going to have, it was going to be where I think, uh, Laura is the last one standing. And instead of her getting shot, she would have ended up in a mental asylum. And the last thing that they saw when they shut the door on her room was Abby standing there looking at her. So that kind of gives you an impression of like, now she's locked in there with her. Now she's, she's at her wit. She's at her, she's at her hands. She could do whatever she wants with her. But I went with the other ending because I thought it, 
and the other ending kind of made sense. It it was like a happy ending, you know. Abby got to go there, and they got to go down there, and it's kind of like you know karma. You know, karma can bite you back good, and those three got karma. And who doesn't want to see karma, especially when it comes to bullying? Oh yeah. <laughs> so. Especially when we want to have hope in the fact that, you know, good wins. But that's an interesting twist, though, making a deal with the devil. You know, and kind of, it, 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 you, you'd you think, okay, yeah, the good guy, but the good guy doesn't usually make a deal with the devil. So I think that's a pretty good, a pretty cool twist in the fact of, you know, how we're, we all have light and dark in us. So I, I thought that was pretty, pretty interesting. Do you have any people that mention their uh, stories that they learn something out of your books to help them in life well i um uh, my book dark avenues my short story collection dark avenues features a uh, it's a uh, i want to call it a splatter western or a weird western where uh, these two brothers have to bury their grandfather again because every every few few times during the year he comes out of his he comes out of his grave the family's cursed and i put that story in there and i had a very good writer friend of mine she told me she goes i read that book and that story made me want to do my own splatter poster mm. And I was completely bowled over. I'm like, thank you. You know, that, that, you know, means a lot to me. And I mean, I've had, a, I'm trying to say what was, yeah, I had a, uh, a 12 year old come up to me while I was in Columbus two years ago. And she had a copy of consuming darkness. And you could tell how many times she'd read this thing. It was all bent and dog-eared and wrinkled and everything. And she just, she came up to me. She's like, are you the guy that, you know, wrote this? And I said, yeah. And she gave me the biggest hug, gave me the biggest hug and said, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm like, do your, do your, I just kind of asked her, like, do your parents know you're reading this? And she's like, they don't care. She goes, but they did get a little mad at me because I presented it as a book report. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's probably not the best idea. <laughs> Take something like that to school and say, I read this. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if it's anything, if her teacher is anything like your teacher was, then, you know, hopefully she's being nurtured into the writing. Uh, exactly. It's kind of interesting if how you have that, if when you have the bug in you, you know, you can't go in a different direction. Like that's, you know, that that's what you're, you kind of knew that that's what you should be doing from, from a young age. It's, that's pretty cool. Did yeah. you waver at all? Go, go in a different direction before you actually decided you were going to really you know, write your books or have you been doing it all along? Well, when I was 11 or 12, I'm not sure when, I brought home a copy of Night Shift from the library. And of course, my mother, she just lost her mind. She's just like, what are you doing with this? Do you know who this is? Do you know what he writes? And she brought it to my dad thinking my dad was going to take her side to it. And he looked over at her, looked over at me, looked over at her and said, Candy, this boy grew up on Stephen King movies, Freddie and Jason, <laughs> um, from beyond, all those movies. He grew up on all of them. Okay? <laughs> if he has nightmares, it's on him. <laughs> he will be fine. And it was ever since I read that, I started doing them at 13 and I started doing them all the way into high school. Um, in between, I want to say my 
uh, sophomore and junior year, I did less fiction and more poetry. And then I got, I left the poetry angle there for a while and then started doing the short stories. And I even did them after I graduated. I started compiling short story collections together, sent them out to places, excuse me, sent them out to places to get published. Did it. 26, published my first short story. That's pretty cool. So I have to ask, when you started writing your poetry, was your poetry, you know, love poetry, you know, that youthful type of poetry, or was it, you know, Edgar, Edgar Allan Poe type of poetry? It was a little bit of both. Ah. Like, I would write a love poem, and then, like, you know what? I wonder what a poem, I wonder what it'd be like if I put a man's body deteriorating from the disrespect he gets from people on a daily basis. Like yeah, you've had a, it in you from the, from day one, you were born with, <laughs> like there was a, there was a part in the poem where these, where this young couple was walking by him and he tipped his hat to him and they're like, back off old man. And all of a sudden he just, he takes two steps and these two fingers just snap off of his hand. Oh, wow. Interesting. And, and it was kind of like, I wonder how that would be in a poem. Cause I didn't think I could be able to do that through, through, through prose. I'm like, how am I going to do this through prose? So I did two drafts of that poem and it ended up like a narrative poem. I never published it. I stuck it in a folder and put it someplace. Uh, too bad. That sounds pretty cool. Oh, uh oh. <laughs> Do you want to talk a little bit about what's going on with New Era? Why we wait for Brian to reconnect? Oh. Let's just give it a minute. to jump back on so what do you think of that poem that's actually pretty interesting somebody somebody treats you badly and your appendages fall out that's pretty cool yeah. that's like if, if imagine if that really was happening oh i think he's backstage there Sorry he is that. my internet's my internet's uh, spots you around this time we were just chatting about how interesting that the, the premise of your story is. Could you imagine if you could see on the outside what what your actions were doing to someone? Yeah. So that's that's a very interesting approach. And to come up with that approach when you're younger, that's that's pretty cool. I followed that approach when I wrote my uh, short story, The Eternal Mr. Trembling. And that is featured in my 10th book, which came out today called Strange Discovery and Other Strange Discoveries. It's my second short story collection. And it's about a guy, he's a solitary man, but he's got a talent. And it's a talent that people know, but he kind of like keeps it on the DL. He doesn't want it getting out to the media. He doesn't want people knowing about it. 
And I kind of refurbished that guy in the poem in that in that story. That's pretty cool. So this this uh, new set of short stories is available where to, to buy on Amazon or anywhere it's, else? It's on Amazon. It's called Strange Discovery and Other Strange Discoveries. It's got 17 short stories in it. Weird, dark, creepy. There's a uh, science fiction story in it. Science fiction body horror. There's a paranormal story that the first story in the collection, which is called Strange Discovery, features the same teenage girl that is in the novella of Dark Avenues. Oh, very cool. Seeing some of the background you've mentioned is uh, film adaptations of books. Have you had the opportunity of having any films? produce on your uh, books or would you be interested in that type of I would setup? be interested I, I would be interested in that um, my uh, one of the um, things on my bucket list is to get my stories adapted for the uh, creep show TV series I grew up with creep show and loved it watched it all the time watched it a lot and it's always been a dream of mine to, you know, get a story adapted for, uh, you know, like a YouTube movie or something like that. I think that would be, that would be great. I think that would just scratch that off the top of my bucket list. Um, I've always thought that Consuming Darkness would make a good um, creature feature. I think it would make a good creature feature because for people who grew up with those, like back in the 80s and 90s, you know, we had like werewolves with Silver Bullet. We had, um, you know, Dracula and Mummy and, you know, the Guild Man. You know, our parents grew up with those. You know, we grew up watching those. But yes. I think uh, Assuming Darkness would make a good creature feature. And I think that th that book in general would make a great, it kind of make a comeback for creature features. It's not a very good look. Now your camera's all fucked up. My camera? Yeah. I'm not sure what's going on. We're having some paranormal experiences now. I was able to see you, but my camera said it was disconnected. I don't have a camera connected to my computer. It's internal. So back to how it was. So I think you should be good. Okay. <laughs> Bring so, some paranormal Brian. with you, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a knack of having a few, you know, ghostly occurrences once in a while, but yeah, you know, I just kind of like, nah, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> Not like JD and I, we run toward it to see what's causing it. <laughs> what some of the most interesting source material for your stories that you've referenced, used. What's that? Said, what are some of the interesting stories that you've found to make stories on? Um, I've always, I've always wanted to do, like, I've been infatuated with other authors when they did short stories, like with Stephen King and Night Chef. I would try to kind of like read what he wrote and kind of like, okay, well, you know, I can take this here because I did a, um, I want to say it was a, uh, yeah, it was a short story about, it's in uh, Strange Discovery and other Strange Discoveries. It's called Jared Was Here and it was, a, and it's about a guy who carved his initials into a tree and the carvings that followed on that tree appeared on his back and I had read a uh, story a, an article where a guy had he done something like that he put his initials into it and like about two days later he started feeling sick he was feverish 
and he had carvings. He had these like these faint carvings all over his shoulder and his and parts of his skin. And I was reading that. I was like, wow. I wonder that would that would actually make a good story. And instead of just keeping it with him, I kind of did it to where it happens around the world all the time. It's kind of like that whole thing with, you know, mother nature and trees, how people are protective of the trees because they give us oxygen and they're kind of part of mother earth. And, and I was like, well, I can just spread that around the world instead of putting it in one place, I can put it everywhere. So I was able to go with that and I was able to incorporate that into a good short story. Um, let me see here. Um, it's usually anything I find like in the news or if I see something, if it just pops in my head, like ideas just boom. Idea will come, will pop into my head while I'm writing something else. So I have to ask, did you do anything for with what happened to what did what happened to people who cut down trees? Did you do anything to them? So instead of just carving into trees that they actually cut down the trees? No, no, no they just they just carved on. <laughs> Interesting. I'd like to see, you know, can you imagine an uh, environmental story? Deforestation oh, yeah. and the horror, the horror response. <laughs> so you talk so so you talked about um abby's wrath and a couple of your short stories there's one that piqued my attention I, I haven't read it i have to admit but it was it's called haunted house born evil can you tell us a little bit about that is that a paranormal type of story or it sparked haunted. my interest uh you talked about 1342 lindley road uh, I, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. 1342. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was something I started thinking about. I wanted to do a paranormal, a supernatural novella for dark avenues, sp specifically for that collection. And I started thinking about this house I used to live in when I was really, really young, you know, I think it was like 91 or 92 we lived there. And I wanted to use that house and incorporate it. And when I wrote that, I wanted to say like, well, it wasn't just a house that it wasn't built by a carpenter who, 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 who had witchcraft. Okay. He wasn't cursed by a witch. There was no bad juju that happened. I wanted the house to be literally, it was born that way. Like how some haunted house. Yeah, there's something paranormal going on right now. <laughs> yeah, your stuff usually doesn't even act up. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of crazy. Nope, we got to give him a chance to come back. Maybe he has a little bit of something around him. <laughs> I'll tell yeah, you what, you're definitely, I am, you definitely got paranormal happening <laughs> in yours. <laughs> and how some haunted house stories and movies are like, well, this person died and now their souls haunt the house. Or like with Amityville, the devil was talking to the boy and he shot his family and now it's haunted. There's always something that happens before people get there. I wanted this to be where it was just born evil. It was just born that way. So was it still built or did it just appear? It was built by an old man by, it was built by a man with the last name of Larson. And after his, and once he and his family got settled, they started to notice a few things and then they had it, and then he had it for a while, and it was occupied here and there. And then the the people who got it, the people who got it after him, they were a hippie cult who did this 
nasty ritual with, you know, spike punch and they were cutting on each other and they were, one guy was pulling his, one guy's pulling his teeth out with a pair of pliers and, and it wasn't just that time. It was, there was another instant where a woman and her kids moved in and something goes bad there. But the house, it's kind of like an attraction. It was kind of like, how can I say this? You know how social media pulls us in? Yeah. And I have nothing against these people before I say this. I have nothing against these people. People who seek attention on social media. That's what that house did for the people who moved in there. It made them feel like they were special, like they were wanted like they and they weren't taken for granted and the house was like hey do this for me i'll make the rest of your life perfect so i kind of wanted it to make it to where the house itself was bad that's pretty interesting it seems like a familiar story just told from a different angle Mm mm-hmm So, have you had any paranormal experiences yourself? So, you, I mean, you said you have, but can you give us an example of something that, that I know you don't want to, you know, you don't want to go chasing after it, but an example of something that, you know, stuck with you. Maybe something while you were writing a book and you didn't expect to happen or you were, inve- you were researching something. Actually, since you mentioned chasing after it, I did chase after one, but I learned my lesson. <laughs> we had come back from California and we lived in this, like a, what they call them, like split level house. Mm-hmm. And it had a front yard that went up like this. It was slanted towards some trees and it went to a private drive. One night we had the windows open. It was summer. It was hot. So we had the windows open and my sister stayed in one bedroom and me and my two brothers stayed in the one down the hallway. I got up to get to get a um, to get a drink of water, and I heard this sound coming from the window, my my sister's bedroom, and it was, patoon, 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 patoon. And I'm like, okay. So I kind of ignored it, and went went back to bed. The following night, not the next night, but the night after that one. Heard it again. Ba-toom, 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 ba-toom. And I'm like, okay, now I'm gonna find out what this is. So by the time I got to her window, I saw these two figures step into the trees and disappear. I'm like, okay, I'm just tired, I'm seeing things, going back to bed. Went back to bed two days later. Heard it again. Ba-dum, ba-dum. Ba-dum, ba-dum. Ba-dum, ba-dum. I got to the window just in time. The two figures that were seated into the trees were wearing Civil War uniforms. Hmm. They were wearing uh, the gray. I think it was the the South. I think the South were, and one of them was standing next to the one playing the drums and the other one had his rifle and they were walking up the drive, up the yard, marching very slowly. So I had the idea of going, I want to get a closer look. Ran downstairs, threw the front door open. And as soon as I got that front door open, something came out of the corner of my eye. And there was a shadowy figure. I didn't look up and see it, but I could see its shadow on the front porch. And it too was dressed like a Civil War soldier. And it just stood, I think it stood about maybe eight feet away from me. And I just froze. I think I stood there for probably 20 seconds, snuck back inside the house, shut, locked the front door, put a kitchen chair in my dad's heavy toolbox, 
in front of that door, <laughs> ran into the living room, threw two blankets over top of me, and sat up until the sun <laughs> came. <laughs> and we moved out of there six, no, about eight months later. And I told the landlord, I asked him, I said, am I the only one who's seeing these people? And he goes, no, but I'm not surprised. I'm like, why do you say that? He said, well, this used to be a Civil War battlefield. I think he said uh, 60 or 65 soldiers were ambushed on that hill. And I was like, wow. And that stuck with me. And I never told any of my family about that. Well, that's pretty cool. It, all, it sounds like you even experienced the feeling of an ambush because you were lured outside. You came out and there was somebody waiting for you as you as you got out the door. So yeah. It gave you that, that same experience, that same feeling. Yeah. That's pretty cool. So did the blankets protect you? Do you think it was the blankets? Yeah, I think it was. I don't think he I don't think he came to the windows and looked in. I was just literally covered up from head to toe. I love that. I love this. We we all think it's like protection from the vampires. I just got to get the blanket over my neck. You know, yeah. <laughs> if I cover my head, if it doesn't see me, I don't see it. Or it doesn't yeah. see if I don't see it, it doesn't see me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um so you so you you do you you have written stories about uh, you know the the conventional paranormal that that we that we talk about um but I did notice too that you you also have gone into kind of almost like a cryptid where you like in your original source short story like big monster is supposed to be similar it's lizard like but it's supposed to be similar to you know like the mysteries of the Loch Ness and even Bigfoot and so on. Um, and then you've gone into type, other types of horror we can talk about, but what's your inspiration for when you come up with the creatures for like for Big Monster? And um, do you do you liken it? I mean, you do in the story, but what, what makes you liken it to the other types of cryptids that we see or we talk about in well, the paranormal world? I wanted to make it different. I didn't want it to be as popular as Mothman or Bigfoot or Loch Ness. Um, I wanted it to be like how I would want a cryptid to look like if I ever encountered one. You know, I would want it to have, you know, I want it to be scary. You know, I want it to be menacing. And when I came up with that, I was like, okay, what's this thing even going to look like? And I was like, okay, it's it's got to have tentacles. It's got to have tentacles. And I was sitting there trying to, trying to, you know, kind of fashion this out in my head. I was like, okay, it travels through water. It's got to travel through water. You know, there's no way for this thing to get around unless there's water around. So I kind of made it a water, uh, a water cryptid. I'm not sure if they call that. Um, but it, it mostly travels through water. It's got the tentacles. It's got the lizard feet. It's got all the attributes of a underwater creature. But this thing does step out once in a while. And I was inspired by the creature from the Black Lagoon. The oh, Gilman. yeah. I wanted to incorporate that into like, oh, I would make this my Gilman. This would be a good Gilman. So I kind of just like came up with this, you know, tall lizard-like creature. He's got the stubby feet, but he's got those tentacles. And those tend to give him the, you know, edge over everybody else. And I thought at first I was kind of overemphasizing, like I was putting, like I was giving it too much gear. I'm like, no, 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 no. Leave it, Leave the tentacles on there. I almost took the stubby feet off and just gave him the tentacles. I'm like, no, leave those on there. They're, yeah. They're fine. Especially, you know, when, when you talk about the big footprints and how, you know, how's he supposed to pick things up and move them around if he doesn't have the tentacles? So if it was a good combination of having, 
having the two um, the two types of body parts. I like that. Yeah. And it's kind of terrifying too at the same time. See, I, I in my book, Consuming Darkness, that's a creature feature. I wrote that one because I don't know if you've ever seen the movie The Beastmaster. Oh, wow. That's an old... I have seen it. It's been a long time, though. But, yeah. It, um, there was a scene in that where he cut that guy from the stone altar, and they had those monsters, those creatures standing around. Yeah. And, the, you know, he tells the guy not to look back, run, don't look back, don't look back. Of course, they all look back. <laughs> and he goes into the arms of one of those creatures, and it wraps him up, and it does this kind of belly dance... And when it opens its arms, all you see is his clothes and his bones. That scene kind of stuck with me. Had a nightmare about it that night. Had a nightmare because my grandma liked to wear movements. She liked to wear those caftans. Had a oh. nightmare. She, had a nightmare. She was giving me a hug, and her caftan was turning into one of those things. Oh. And. I kept that in memory for a long, long time when I said, okay, what's my second book going to be? It's going to be a creature feature. But I got to look up and see what that creature is. And I watched a YouTube video about it, and they call it a winged devourer. They are a non-alien type creature. And what they do is they wrap those wings around you and they press their face up against the top of your head, and it secretes this acid that softens your flesh. Yes. But they don't eat your clothes, your bones, or the items in your pocket. That's tough. The scientist in me, when I hear acid, that's not, it's not picky, but yes, <laughs> I see that. <laughs> And when I heard that, I was like, oh, I am going to have fun with this one. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I just kind of went that, I just went with that one. And Consuming Darkness has that kind of connection with me because as a child, I was afraid of this thing, you know? Yeah. So I wanted to like, hey, you know, if I'm afraid of it, I'm not saying I want you guys to be afraid of it, but it exists. So be afraid or be brave. And like I said, that was, that was one of my, I, I love doing that book. I loved it. That's awesome. That's pretty cool. Do you have a thought, JD, do you want to ask him anything? I have another question, but if you want to ask him, I don't want to monopolize, monopolize this time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it all sounds pretty interesting, but, I'm not a writer and I don't read books very often, so. <laughs> That's okay. So you should read some of his short stories. Then you can, you get, you, you can get a small dose of it and you don't have to read a whole big book. And there, I'll probably you know, read just... something like that as I'm used to movies that do that same set of yeah. same template. It's kind of, it's, you know, and, and they're kind of fun. I, you know, from the, from, from what I've read, you know, he's got, he's got a good knack for telling the story and, and, and you, you can identify with the people that he talks about, which is kind of, which is kind of cool. Um, okay. So, I mean, how, how can I not talk about zombies? So I, I see you have at least a couple on, on zombies, but I, I, I saw dead river as one of your so so first let me say you're from ohio right yes and so you i've noticed that you've based your stories in like a lot either they start in ohio or they're based in ohio i've noticed that you you kind of you, you know you you call out your or you you bring up your your you know home state do you do you do that in all your stories or is there a reason why you choose ohio you know because you're is it not just because you're from there or from here, so if you can give us a little idea. Well, I I haven't been anywhere else, you know, for you know, except you know California, and I wasn't there enough to get enough information to 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 put something in in there. But um, Ohio, it's it's always been like 
one of those places that I can just, I can take pieces of my memory of places that I've been there and I can reshape them to look a certain way and then incorporate that into the stories. Like the town of Langston, Ohio, which is featured in um, Consuming Darkness, Abby's Wrath, and Bad Allergies. Yeah, that that's another one a, I want to talk about. <laughs> that was a mix of all the towns that I've been in Ohio, that I've lived in. And I could always take these towns and kind of like, okay, I'm going to take their town square and I'm going to put this over here and that over there. So there's nothing coincidental on with it. Yeah. Or I would, um, or I would kind of like see a place and go, Hey, I remember that, that, that road. So I'll put that road in here. And Dead River started. If you read Dead River, that starts at an actual place that I went to in Marion. It was like a, oh. a nice kind of posh yeah. restaurant that sat. It was it was kind of an A frame on a hill, and you could look and see the Ohio River. You could see the river, the the bridge going into West Virginia. And I said, you know. This would be a good place for a zombie now to start. Because <laughs> that's and, what everybody thinks when they're out having dinner, looking at the scenery. <laughs> oh yeah, and um, when I when I started doing that one, I wanted to incorporate because I have not only been inspired by the George Romero movies, but I was also inspired by. Brian King's novels, The Rising and Dead Sea. And I wanted to kind of take a little bit of Dead Sea and put it in here. And I, but when I did that, I also wanted to create a character who had a guilt. He had this big, heavy guilt on his shoulders. And at first, the book was called The River Rat. And he was going to be like a Santa Claus to the, you know, survivors who were locked up. Like if you needed water or you needed inhalers, you would hit him up on the CV and he would bring it to your house. But then I got to thinking, well, that wouldn't actually make survival easy. Because if you watch the the, uh, George Romero movies, survival's not easy. Food is scarce. It's all about survival. So I took that aspect out and I said, okay, he's trying to get out of Ohio. He stopped here to sleep. And now he's, you know, he's a guy with a boat and he's stranded and he's got these three kids that he promised to take to Texas. These guys came by, stole some stuff that wasn't theirs and ripped the spark plug out of the boat and threw it in the river. So now he's stranded and he's got a 15 year old girl, a 12, uh, an 11 year old boy and a baby. So how's he going to be able to survive this? How's he going to be able to make it to where they're safe and still honor his, and still honor his, his promise. So he, so I had to flip a coin and I said, you know what? They're going with him, putting the baby in the mix, raised the tension. It raised the suspense. It made people concerned for the characters because I had had people book blurb that book and every one of them have come back and said that baby better not die. (laughs) They don't care about anybody else, but the baby definitely better not. Baby does not die. And <laughs> all of humanity. Yes. So I'm and, glad you made them happy. <laughs> and I'm the same way when it comes to watching horror movies. Yeah. I hate seeing animals die. Yeah. I can see people yeah, get guilty. shot. I can see people get stabbed. But dogs, cats, horses, no. It's like, nope, nope. That's a big definite no, no for me. Nope. Yeah, I'm guilty <laughs> of that too. Totally. Okay. I want to ask you about um, about you talked a little bit about bad allergies and this this story is about like this pollen that 
smells like patchouli and basically makes people crazy. They, they act out in extreme violence. But what's pretty cool is, so you have a main character and what I like seeing is bringing forth, you know, you know, characters that we don't get to see every day. You have, um, I think the main character is Wendy and then you have um, the other main character. She has to travel um, and she has to travel with the other main character, uh, Gail, right? Yeah. And Gail is transgendered. So you're bringing in the, a different type of character that we don't normally see in horror movies. And I like that you're putting that on the forefront and you're putting that into your book as, as, as main characters. It's pretty cool. Can you talk a little bit about that and your inspiration for that? Well, Bad Allergies was inspired by when I was 21, I got a copy of Off Season by Jack Ketchum. My brother read it first. He handed it to me and said, don't say I didn't warn you. I went and I read it. It took me three days to read it. <laughs> Blew my mind. This book was published in 1981 by the Village Voice, and people burned this book. It was violent. They thought it was very violent. It was very visceral. They thought it was just gory and sick, and they didn't want no part of it. I mean, cannibalism so, is kind of scary. <laughs> it makes a lot of sense. Oh, yeah. And I looked up other things that Jack Ketchum had done. I found out he did a sequel to Off Season. I found out he did a book called Red where an old man is fishing and these kids come over and they harass him and try to tell him to get off the land. And he's got this red, just like dog. It kind of reminds you of, if you've ever watched the cartoon, uh, uh, damn it, Hank Hill. No. What's it called again? King of the Hill. Oh, King of the Hill. Yes, yes. yes. It's a dog that looks like Ladybird. And this dog <laughs> goes after one of the boys, and the boys kill it. And that old man goes back and gets vengeance uh, against them. But Ketchum released a book called Ladies' Night. And that was about a chemical tanker that spilled in the middle of New York City and drove all the women crazy. And yeah. I read that book and read that book, I mean, over and over and over and over again. And I'm like, okay, it's been over 15 years since I've read, since that book has been burning my memory. It's time to do this. So I was set out to do a homage to Jack Ketchum's Ladies Night. And I said, how am I going to do this? And I kind of had to go take a walk kind of get my mind clear come up with something good and i got to main street i got to the main drag of uh, the town i live in uh, chancey and this big huge white mist of pollen i don't know where it came from just swept right across the street and i'm just like oh no and I covered my nose because I suffer from allergies. <laughs> a whole other kind of horror, by the way. I, but. <laughs> I got home and I said, that's how we're going to do this. That's how we're going to do this. And the ending, that one, I knew what was going to happen. I wanted to give Wendy some kind of a disability to slow her down that would heighten the tension, that would heighten the suspense. Cause she's, cause I don't know if you read the back of it, but she's got a medical boot on her foot. Yeah, broken broken foot, right? And she's trying to maneuver this whole visceral landscape. She's trying to survive this on one good foot. And I knew what was going to happen. I knew like everything that was going to happen up until the ending. Cause I had three endings for this and I kept wrestling with them. And one of them was they were going to get a hold of the national guard and the national guard was just going to bomb the place. Um, they were going to make it out of town 
but the army's there on a roadblock, gets them out of the car, shoots them, gets back, puts their bodies in the dump truck, and drives away like nothing happened. Or there was going to be those, there was going to be that unhappy ending where the main character dies. And I'm like, okay. But I got halfway to the, I think it was like the next to last chapter. And I said, you know what? I'm going to twist this around a bit. People expect her to live. People expect her to be the survivor, the final girl. What if I turned this on its head and did something different? And that's exactly what I did with it. Sure, there were a lot of sad, uh, <laughs> sad emotions by the time somebody hit sand. It's hard. It's it's a it's a bold move to get rid, of, like to kill off the main character. Yeah. So. Well, remember what Stephen King said: "Kill all your darlings." <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's pretty cool. So, um, you want to tell us a little bit about where people can find you? On well, social media, we know your I'm books on, are on Amazon. I'm on Facebook under Brian J. Smith. I'm on Instagram and threads under Horror Arthur 9. Um, you can find my books on Amazon. Um, you know, just leave a good, leave an honest review. I've only gotten one one star review so far. Do I think I'm going okay there? I think I got a good record. Somebody got yeah, mad at me. you're doing good. <laughs> somebody, got, somebody had actually gotten mad at me for a scene in Dead River where the young boy asked the main character, Colin, the, the young boy's Jason, he asked Colin for a gun. Well, his sister, Stacy, she's holding the baby who's named Rosie, and she goes, you're not getting a gun. Mom and dad will kill me. And Colin looks at her and says, what are your parents Democrats? Now, I'm not, I'm not that, I, I don't usually put politics in there, but when I, when I wrote the that, I was kind of thinking about the scene in The New Hills Have Eyes where Aaron Stafford's trying to look for a phone signal and there's Ted Levine and Dan Burke getting their guns ready and Dan Burke's like, hey, don't try this, man, it'll make you powerful. And he's like, whoa, whoa, get that out of my face. And Ted Levine, he looks at Dan Bird and goes, son, Dan doesn't like him. He's a Democrat. <laughs> yeah. so I kind of thought that was like, okay, that's kind of a funny dig at your son-in-law. But I was like, you know, I'll put this in there, kind of make a joke about it. Oh, no, 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 no. They stopped reading it, gave me a one-star review. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you can't make everybody happy. Nope. And the fact that they felt so emotionally connected that they would have that kind of response, maybe that's a good thing. And I Take the review people, as a badge of honor. And I've had people read that book and said, I noticed it, but I didn't let it, but it didn't keep me from finishing the book. Yeah. Uh. Well, it's been fun, Brian. Thank you for having me on. If you ever, I, I'd, be, I'd be happy to come back on. Yeah, we'd love to have you. It was fun. I like hearing about your stories, your inspirations. We appreciate it. Okay. Thank you for having me on. I'm going to go ahead and wrap up the show. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us for this episode of the podcast. We hope you were able to learn something new during this video. We will be hosting another podcast interview next Wednesday at 7 p.m. Are we still on for that, Irene? Next week, seven. Next week, we don't. We do not have a podcast next week. No. Yeah. So everybody have a great Halloween. Watch some scary movies. Um. <laughs> Also, in the meantime, make sure to check out the Nepi Investigates YouTube series on our YouTube platform. We have 24 episodes in total. 
in the series and full videos are being released on the Spirit Channel and Paranormal Family Channel on a monthly basis. Also, make sure to check out Brian. Uh, do you want to say your tags one more time? I'm on Facebook under Brian J. Smith, and I'm on Instagram and threads under Horror Author 9. Yeah. Uh, 